Heather Johnson, thanks for joining us on uh, Jerusalem Dateline. Uh, I'm here in Jerusalem. You're there in California at the time. Uh, but major things that are happening here in the Middle East and around the world, one of the main things here happening in uh, Israel is the change of a new government. Naftali Bennett is Israel's new prime minister, uh, uh, the iconic prime minister for many years, uh, uh, more than any other prime minister in Israel's history. Benjamin Netanyahu is no longer in office uh, right now. But you know Naftali Bennett. You know some of the members of this new government. Uh, tell us about them and tell us what you think God is doing in this shakeup here in Israel. Well, thank you, Chris, for having me. And um, it is such a wild time, isn't it? Um, in Israel and really around the world. Um, but I think the new government is a timing thing. It seems like, you know, that God would at some point need to look to a new government, a new generation to be able to bring up and to get into place and so while we have this extraordinary lion-hearted uh, prime minister in Netanyahu, a scholar, probably the most brilliant expert on the Middle East that is possible, has strategic depth, um, it would seem that the shaky part of this is God having to make a transition to a new generation. And I think Naftali Bennett is brilliant. You know, he is not just brilliant um, in business where he sold two of his businesses for 135 million, 150 million in his 30s, but um, he has had a real penchant to be in the political realm since he's been in his 30s. And so he had a great mentor in Mayor Ron Nachman, um, who was the leading mayor of Samaria. He understands the dynamics of Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. And he's a little bit of a step to the right of Prime Minister Netanyahu and his conservative views and even his values. I think that it's a rocky road. It's a wide um, government um, with a lot of disparate parties, as you know, they may not be able to hold on to it, but it would just seem that Israel may be exactly in that generational shift and I think Naftali and uh, Gideon Saar, who's the new justice minister, are great friends of mine. And um, I have nothing but wonderful things to say about them. Um, they've got a ways to go in getting a strategic depth view um, of the world and the Middle East and all of those things. But I believe they'll get there. One of the other major things that are happening here in the Middle East is uh, what they call the Abraham Accords, uh, signed at the end of last year. Uh, you know many pe people that have been involved in that. Uh, tell us what you think about the Abraham Accords and what changes does this uh, bode for, uh, for the Middle East? Um, well, I was actually at the White House on the, on the lawn when, on the signing of these, uh, the first two Abraham Accords, and I, I walked away just knowing that Israel had changed overnight, had become stronger and I think um, that, the, that these Abraham Sunni Arab nations need Israel and Israel needs these nations um, in the face of a threat with Iran and in going into the future to create a huge staging ground in the Middle East for trade and, and, and diplomatic relations and possibilities. So I think these things were anticipated by God. You know, um, we've been leading tours. I've been leading the congressional senior leadership tours to Israel for years now, a decade. And part of the teaching that we go through is um, just understanding that in the rebuilding of the nation of Israel, the kings are going to come. The nations are going to actually come into Israel. Um, they're going to be foster fathers. They're going to be nursing mothers. They're going to play a role. Um, they're going to seek trade. Um, I sat with Prime Minister Netanyahu just a few years ago and went literally through a Bible study with him and showed him the verses. And he's he's like, these are, are these for today? And I said, well, there's no reason not to think that to think that they're not for today, that uh, the kings will come and they will rebuild your walls. The, the foreigners are going to serve you and you're going to be in a time where uh, people are going to seek you out, you know, for technological advances, artificial intelligence, all those things that you've, you know, in which you've risen to greatness. The kings are going to come to the brightness of your rising. So I believe that these are a fulfillment. These Abraham Accords fulfill some of those um, Isaiah prophecies, in, or at least are at the beginnings of doing that. I think we can uh, understand that that's what that is. So, um, but the, the Abraham Accords more practically certainly have opened up new possibilities for the United States and Israel. Um, it, is a, it is an extraordinary, probably the most significant 
um, milestone of the U.S. Admin administration under Donald Trump, mm -hmm. uh, certainly the feat of their administration. So I think we've got a, a huge frontier to, um, to, to be able to see um, a lot happen on, and it's, it's to be anticipated. The major changes politically, geopolitically, politically with a new government, geopolitically with the Abraham Accords, but also the rise of adversaries. And uh, a lot of people are concerned about the rise of China. And, mm -hmm. uh, and one effort I know you're aware of is trying to take uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, that out of China and perhaps here in the Middle East. Tell us about that. Yeah, I think that the United States would, across the board, with bipartisan support in Congress, would understand that China is an existential threat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whereas uh, uh, President Obama in 2012 encouraged our involvement in China, including Israel, um, obviously those days have changed. And um, it is it has become apparent that we want to see Israel wean themselves off of China. China has has come into Israel in a very dynamic way. They've got um, incredible infrastructure projects that they've been handed with, you know, port in Haifa and and um, it, tunnels under you know, the city of Haifa. And it's extraordinary how they've made their way and their tentacles into Israel. And so Israel, so the United States is concerned about that. And then of course the pharmaceutical life sciences is primary. You know, the United States American interest today is to think how can we reduce our dependency there? Um, how do we can nearshore our life sciences and pharmaceutical companies? And so the House Energy and Commerce Committee has jurisdiction over the CDC and over the FDA, and they are really examining how to incentivize U.S. private industry um, into out of China and into Israel. And so we have led some of the briefings for the House Foreign Affairs Committee, um, Energy and Commerce, to bring to bear some of those key leading pharmaceutical giants um, that are related to the Middle East and to show why there's an advantage of U.S. companies moving out of China and her tributaries and why moving and setting up their resource centers in Israel, their production in Israel, and even in the UAE and some of these Arab Abraham Accord nations. So this is really being looked at it. I believe it's the hottest topic on Capitol Hill today. It is a problem to solve. And I believe the Congress over time is gonna figure this out, um, a way to spread out and get our uh, pharmaceutical and life sciences into the hand, hands of our allies. Yeah, and that was brought uh, to importance so much during the uh, coronavirus pandemic when uh, mm -hmm. many of those pharmaceuticals were actually came from China. And, mm -hmm. uh, and also CBN News just did a story on uh, the digital currency that China is developing right now, which is really alarming, uh, mm -hmm. not only for people in China, but also the rest of the world. Um, and as you said, it's a hot topic on Capitol Hill. Uh, mm -hmm. You're involved in Capitol Hill with many of the congressmen and women. You're also involved on the hills of Samaria, uh, mm -hmm. which JH Israel, and we've had mm -hmm. at CBN News the privilege of reporting on that throughout mm -hmm. the years. There's an amazing uh, phenomenon there on the hills of Samaria. Uh, tell us why you've been involved in that, you and Bruce and the JH Israel team for many years. Why, why is this such a special endeavor? Well, I think that we have always um, had our eyes on what is it that God is doing? Where is he working inside the nation of Israel? When we first had that call 23 years ago to try to find a, how can we be relevant and um, find our place there to, to do what would be helpful. And so we kind of stumbled around. But what we began to really understand that as um, as was prophesied by Ezekiel, particularly chapter 36, there's a real chronological process, almost like Ezekiel 36 is a microcosm of biblical prophecies, but it follows a real succession. And I think that one of the, the prophecies that we really believed was up and coming um, 20 years ago would be that if God's gonna rebuild the cities and reestablish Samaria, then he, he's going to also fulfill that big blanket promise that I'm going to take out the heart of stone out of this nation. I'm going to give them a heart of flesh and put a new spirit where they're going to be able to come and find me in a personal way. 
And I think that was where we set sail to build the National Leadership Center um, as a staging ground in Samaria. Um, and follow up to that, Jeremiah 31 prophesies that during those days of Israel's restoration, he's going to send the Gentiles, the Nazarene, to the mountains of Samaria. And they're going to say to Israel, come, let's go up to the Lord our God. Well, what in the world was Isaiah? I mean, what was Jeremiah seeing back in captivity, but Gentiles showing up in Samaria with a keen interest to, to validate Israel's identity, to be able to come in and play a major role um, in seeing that untenable sec secularism move out and let's go up to the Lord our God. So that's what we've done. We've built a, a national leadership as the mm -hmm. staging ground. We've had eight, 85,000 young people go through the training there. If you can imagine coming into Samaria on buses um, to go through leadership training in discovering their life's purpose, how to relate to God, how to understand themselves and be able to relate to the other, uh, which is really essentially what leadership is. So um, we are now in working in the schools of Israel. Um, what, what I would say is that we have watched in the last 10 years, Chris, a major sea change in the culture of Israel. Uh, the Ministry of Education is playing that, that dominant role um, in educating all the children of Israel. The, every family is involved there. That's where the sea change is taking place. To lose your story, your biblical story, is to lose your identity. Mm -hmm. To be a stranger to God is to be a stranger to yourself. And there's that realization from the top of the country all the way down to the, the municipality level that Israel has to have a keen, deep understanding of who they really are in order to be a light to the nations, in order to be able to have their this next generation really flourish inside the state of Israel. It's just like uh, rediscovering their roots. What impact do you see that happening on many of the thousands of uh, Israelis that come to JH Israel? Well, they're coming to the National Leadership Center. Um, JH Israel supports that National Leadership Center. We've mm -hmm. helped write content with the Ministry of Education and all of that. We've played an underpinning of support. But the National Leadership Center um, is playing that role where when people show up, they're encountering the presence of God. They're going climbing on ropes courses. They're going through a real tactical process, almost like an IDF type experience. But they're reflecting on the life of King David, Joshua, um, Caleb, kind of your major leaders out of the Bible. And they're putting themselves in their shoes. They're saying, how did this person relate to God? How did they really come to know who they were? And then how did they relate to larger Israel? And so they're, they're actually going through a personal process of transformation. A lot of healing takes place there. Um, um, as you open the Bible for the very first time in your life and start to read it, it's powerful. You know, the sword of God, the Bible is like a sword. It goes in um, sort of like um, an ax for the frozen sea within you. And it has played that role in the National Leadership Center. Oh, wow. Well, well I've, as, I, as I said, I've seen it in action. Uh, it, it's an amazing place. So you've written curriculum for that. You've also written a book called Uncommon Favor, The Intentional Life of a Disciple. Uh, tell us why you wrote this book. Well, I wrote it because um, I think we've been in a journey for the last 23 years that has been nothing short of miraculous. Um, I think that what we came into Israel to do is to serve, um, to play a hidden role, um, to find where we could be relevant in support to what was going on. We have had the opportunity to be able to watch and even play a role in helping facilitate some of these unfolding prophecies. We've been right in the middle of it. And so mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to give an eyewitness account to some of those things. Um, so the story, the book is a narrative, um, but it also in the process of calling each person to a personal review of what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus. It harkens back to that first century uh, rabbi Talmud relationship, the Talmud being the disciple under a rabbi, um, what it really meant. What did Jesus really mean by becoming a disciple of his? And then it sort of leads um, you through a process into some personal decisions about who you want to become. And Chris, I wrote it in the middle of COVID-19. We couldn't be in a more chaotic, convulsing world where there's been great loss in people's private life. There's a loss of identity. 
there's grief, there's loss of, of life. Um, there's been a great um, sense of ambiguity in relationships. People have been forced into technology um, to try to have relationships. Um, so this book comes at a good time to review identity, personal identity, and to make some personal decisions. I wrote it um, also because I believe a disciple is one who is hooked into the larger purposes of God. Mm-hmm. They are they are making, they're involved in that which is transforming society. And so the importance today in our very chaotic and impersonal world, um, and even including mega churches where we come to church and we can't figure out where we belong, um, we are standing at a time where more important than ever to find that tribe of yours, that group of people that are inside the mountains of society affecting change and to make sure you're situated there with a group of disciples who are uh, making an impact, um, whether in your nation or you're being called to another nation. A great example is being hooked into these unfolding prophecies over Israel, understanding them in our day, and how they can have a reverberating effect back on our nation. Well, you've certainly been involved in uh, many of these prophetic uh, unfoldings here in Israel uh, and the U.S. uh, as a disciple. Uh, Heather, give us a 30,000-foot view of where you think uh, the U.S. is, Israel, and the world in large. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, we are, I think it feels, if you look at it, Chris, it feels like we are barreling toward the last days, doesn't it? Um, I've always taken a very conservative view of that, because being inside the unfolding prophecies of Israel, you see how long it takes just for one thing to happen. And, and that you can't speak conclusively that it already did happen. So we've so you have to um, look at things um, with real circumspect in that way. But the 30,000 view is that we're in a time of great harvest. Um, we are in a, a time where we're being called individually to step up our responsibilities, to take a more active role in transforming society. And I think as people do that, we will see a change in our world. Um, There were 12 disciples that went out and believe you me, they transformed the society of their day. They made the big dent. They were able to do something that was so consequential that it literally affected, you know, generations to come. Abraham did the same thing. We have that opportunity as well. U.S.-Israel relations, um, I think, is strong. Even with a new administration there, we have got a strong Congress uh, relating to Israel. Uh, We've got challenges ahead of us, but I think the the collaboration has so many fronts now with which to grow from artificial intelligence, continuing missile defense, integrated business between Palestinians and Israelis. We've been able to see a lot of roads lift up for a U.S., a robust U.S.-Israel relationship. Yeah, speaking of the U.S.-Israel relationship, you have a, uh, a tour coming up for congressmen and women uh, here mm-hmm. in Israel and up to uh, the hills of Samaria. Uh, tell us about that uh, visit and why is this relationship so important? Yes, I, I believe that what we want to do, if you can kind of think of a strategic aim of the United States, it would be certainly to get the Congress to Israel. Um, what happens, though, often is that they'll fly over on a one-day CODEL tour, meet with the prime minister, and fly back. Um, our trips are highly geared towards education and really bringing them in to meet with the experts, not just the top officials, which we do, but to meet with the experts in the area of those collaborative points on missile defense, on um, the Middle East peace conflict. So we take them through Judea and Samaria to meet with the Palestinian leaders as well as the Israeli leaders um, leaders, and to really understand the peace process because for so long the U.S. would not let Congress come into Judea and Samaria. We were allowed, it was actually um, it was actually outlawed, you couldn't do it. So we've been able to bring those tours through there and provide um, some real important um, education so that they can go back and make informed decisions. What you want Congress to do is to take an active leadership role. 
because regardless of who the president is of the United States, whether we have a Barack Obama who is, was not so friendly or we have a President Trump who's the best friend of Israel, Congress plays a steady leveraging role. And that's why these trips, these advanced education trips that we're taking are so important. They're going to take yeah. a real strong look at artificial intelligence, um, the life sciences, all of those things will be included on our trip. Yeah, going back to the uh, Abraham Accords, tell us about some of the miracles during the Trump administration and, uh, and some of the stories that you have to tell. Yeah, well, I think one of the big stories, you know, I woke up one morning in, in, the, in 2009 and I heard the Lord say to me, I want you to lead the Congress through Israel, um, particularly Judea and Samaria, and I'm going to raise up the U.S.-Israel collaboration to another level. Well, I mean, he might as well have given that word to my four-year-old granddaughter. You know, <laughs> it was so out of reach, and I was not involved in government at all, but I had a great mentor in Mayor Ron Nachman, mm -hmm. and um, we we, so it took two years. I, you know, you kind of sometimes hear the Lord speak to you and you just let the word flap in the wind, hoping it'll snap free. That's exactly what I thought about that word. But it eventually came stronger. And um, so I kind of wrote out on a piece of paper what I thought the four objectives would be in bringing Congress to Israel, um, what it needed to be for advanced senior leaders. And through a series of real miraculous steps, I ended up sitting in front of Eric Cantor, if you all will remember him. Uh, he, was the, um, he was the highest ranking Jewish official um, in, in the United States at the time, uh, the majority leader of the Congress. And he had been looking for somebody to lead these tours. So I just walked in and we just had a match that was kind of made in heaven. And he said, I can't even believe this. I'm gonna populate your tours. So we set sail from there. And I think the most shocking thing that happened, Chris, was on our very first tour to Israel in, 20, in 2011. And, you know, sometimes as a disciple, you show up, but you don't know what in the world you're doing. <laughs> That's what this felt like. And I knew, I knew some of the things we were supposed to be doing. I was leading tours. We had been, built the National Leadership Center, had been in Samaria and the West Bank for 10 years. So there were certain things I knew, but boy, did I have a dropping off point. And I'll never forget Doug Lamborn, you know, pulling on my shirt and saying, we have got to go see Israel's Iron Dome. Nobody has seen it yet. And it was just the new and upcoming um, situation. And I thought to myself, oh, my word, how am I going to achieve that? We ended up in the um, office of the prime minister and he looked at me at the end of the, the meeting with the Congress and he, he asked me a question and I, I diverted his question and said, do you think that we could go see Iron Dome? Um, you know, we've got the, the senior leadership of the armed services committee here. Nobody's seen it yet. And I kind of put him on the spot. So he agreed right there to declassify Iron Dome. So we found ourselves in this van going over rocks and boulders, trying to get out to go see an Iron Dome installation the following day. And all I could think about is the foreigners will rebuild your walls, O Israel. The kings are going to serve you. And it was just beautiful um, because Doug Lamborn went on with these five members of Congress to return back to D.C., and they created the legislation that tripled the budget for Iron Dome which was able to get the Iron Dome installations, not just on the borders, but now in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and all over the nation of Israel. Uh, it was only a year and a half later that Israel went into an egregious or egregious attack from Hamas um, and they were protected by Iron Dome. Um, but it took that long to get all of that in place from the U.S. Congress, the collaboration with Israel, and then to literally get the money to do all of that. Wow. So we've played a major role in that. That was my first trip to Israel. And we went through Judea and Samaria and got legislation opened up there as well. So these tours and these trips are so important um, inside the U.S.-Israel collaboration, for sure. Yeah. Well, the Iron Dome has just been in use in the last uh, several weeks. I saw it in action myself. It's an amazing uh, technology that really has saved so many Israelis and also Palestinian lives. Uh, well, uh, Heather, Kolika vote, as they say over here, with great respect of all the things you've been involved in, whether on Capitol Hill, the Hills of Samaria, uh, mm -hmm. JH Israel, and uh, all in your new book, 
Uh, Tolika Vode, and great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris.